Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We are in unit four, the poetry unit, and we now pick up poetry collection number three, starting on page 670-671. Here in a second, we're going to do James Weldon Johnson's My City, but before we get there, let's go through it to be some important information that we'll be using in our study of poetry collection three and four. I'm with you on page 671. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here on all of this stuff because we're going to come back to it. But we're going to be spending a lot of time with it to, to be write it down. Poetic forms. To unify sounds and ideas in a poem, a poem may follow a poetic form, defined structure, sometimes what we call closed form, right? Each poetic form uses a set number of lines and a distinctive meter and pattern of rhymes. Uh, we're going to look at more of this on 630, 631 in a second. We're going to see Tanka poetry, which is an unrhymed Japanese form. Some examples are provided. We're going to see sonnets. We're going to see a Shakespearean sonnet with ka trains and couplets. Um, we're going to talk about those. Um, uh, look over on page uh, 672. We're going, to see, we're going to hear about the Italian or the Petrarchian sonnet. We're going to learn about the Vinali, um, which is a 19-line poem uh, of repeated lines and specific rhyme scheme. By the way, for those of you who are at all interested in rap artists, a number of really gifted rap artists, I'm thinking now of Eminem as a classic exemplar, very influenced by poetic form. They came through school and many of them studied this kind of thing and it informed the very music that they created. That notion of anticipating rhythm and rhyme and all of that. The other thing that we want to point out at the bottom of 672 is this reading poetic form chart that will help us. All right, And as well, this notion of reading fluently. So the smoothness with which we read these poems, my hope, as we have said many times, is that you're engaging this text, these texts on your own first. You're doing your own pre-class reading annotative work on your own and then coming to LearnStrong.net and using me and these lectures as a way to help you to understand these poems. So hopefully, that when you're working with me on, um, in, in, in this kind of thing, this is not your first time to see these poems. When you are working alone, one of the challenges is to read fluently. Learning to read the poetry aloud is a key to learning how to do this well. By the way, you want to pay attention to punctuation, the type of pauses. Look at page 673. The period is a full stop. So if you see a period in a poem, full stop. The colon, almost as strong as a period, end with your voice raised just enough so that a listener knows to expect more. The semicolon is less strong than a colon. Pause briefly with your voice raised. And then the comma is a slight pause. So as we read these poems, and as we listen to professional reader, or I'm the one reading the poem, we want to pay attention to the ways in which punctuation works for us. All right, let's turn now to the first of our four authors that we'll be looking at in poetry collection number three. Uh-oh, huge. On 674, you know these vocab words are going to end up on the assessment. Easy if you know the words for those questions to be answered correctly, so I would recommend. We're going to mess, uh, first, of all, first of all, we're going to mess around with uh, My City, a poem by James Walden Johnson. Let's uh, meet him briefly on 675. 1871 to 1938, born in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Johnson became the first African American allowed to practice law in Florida. Whoa, let's write that down, so that's a big deal. Johnson also published a newspaper and was a leader in the civil rights uh, movement and civil rights work there. Now the background to this poem uh, on page 677, just read with me. Contemporary poets who write Shakespearean sonnets may slightly modify the rhyme scheme. In this sonnet, Johnson uses a modified scheme in the first two quatrains or groups of four lines. In the rest of the poem, however, he follows classic Shakespearean form. Let's pause for a moment at 2B and let's write this down. When we meet sonnet writing, yes, we are talking about three things. One, always 14 lines. Can't be 13, can't be 15, got to be 14 lines. Okay? So the moment you look at any poem that has 14 lines, you immediately are looking at a sonnet. Take a look at my city and recognize it has 14 lines. Two, we always have some kind or sense of end rhyme. Notice, without even reading this poem, that night rhymes with sight. Do you see it? Line one rhymes with line four. Cross, loss. Do you see it? Line two rhymes with line three. Do you see it? Then we start again. Trees, these, birds, herds. Do you see it? Then notice we go smells, comes, spells, uh, slums, 
and then we have the last rhymed couplet of pity city. Do you see it? Okay, the last rhymed couplet. So we're always looking at how the end rhyme works. Now, you can have sonnets that don't have end rhyme. Those are modern sonnets, okay? Notice here, though, we have a sonnet that has a certain kind of end rhyme. But as your uh, textbook company just uh, provided for you, slightly modified from the Shakespearean A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. That is to say, three of these quatrains, as we call it. Four sets of lines is called a qua qua, meaning four quatrain. Finally, number three. Let's review. One, 14 lines. Two, some kind of end rhyme. Three, you have some sense of meter. All right? That is to say, the rhythm in the line itself. Shakespeare loved the iambic foot, ba bum, not stress, stress, ba bum, and he liked it five times in a line, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. In our freshman year, we studied Romeo and Juliet, so we can remember it. A pair of star cross lovers take their life. The Romeo and Juliet opening lines: A pair of star cross lovers take their life. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. Yes. Now, of course, modern writers can play the same game. Look at the opening line of this: When I come down to sleep. Death's endless night. Opening line. Look at it again. When I come down to sleep, death's endless night. And yet notice if I scan this, that is to say I slow it down. When I come down to sleep, death's endless night. You see it? Look at it again with me. When I come down to sleep, death's endless night. So in other words, here, Johnson is going to be playing around with the very iambic pentameter of Shakespeare. And to that degree, he's reaching way, way back in time to an earlier form. Now, it is true that you can read this entire poem and not necessarily hear the ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. It, it can be read any number of ways, and normally when we read it, we don't read it with the inflection of that kind of ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. But we want to pay attention that it's there in every line. No doubt, it's there in every line. And, as I challenge you to write your own Shakespearean sonnet, you'll want to play around with that notion of ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Okay? Everybody good to go? All right, let's turn now to the poem itself. Hey, let's just point this out at level one. This is a poem that does not celebrate nature the way that William Carlos Williams' Spring and All celebrated nature. This is a poem that celebrates the city, more particularly New York City. Now, of course, New York City has been celebrated over the years by many, many artists. This is one more famous rendition of that. What makes the city so amazing? Of course, those of us who don't live in a large city, we live in a small town, of course, here in Orland, there's always been this debate about which is better, the small town or the big city. Johnson will say, there is no comparison. The city is the greatest place to live. Let's listen now to what he has to say about the city, all right? Here we go. Enjoy. My City by James Weldon Johnson. When I come down to sleep death's endless night, the threshold of the unknown dark to cross, what to me then will be the keenest loss when this bright world blurs on my fading sight? Will it be that no more I shall see the trees or smell the flowers or hear the singing birds or watch the flashing streams or patient herds? No, I'm sure it will be none of these. But ah, Manhattan's sights and sounds, her smells, her crowds, her throbbing force, the thrill that comes from being of her apart, her subtle spells, her shining towers, her avenues, her slums. Oh God, the stark, unutterable pity to be dead and never again behold my city. All right, now let's point out there's a whole lot of things Johnson is doing in this poem, and I just want to show you a few of those things as we get into this study. I mean, we could spend a whole lot of time on this poem, but let's just stay just to the key ideas. Notice, first of all, the question. Shall we write it down at level one? This poem begins with a question. When I come down to sleep death's endless night, the threshold of the unknown dark to cross. Let's pause at 3A. Johnson is reaching back to an early epic tradition. Let's put it in our notes. We already know it from our freshman study. To be an epic hero, yes, you have to go to the underworld. 
that saying when somebody's mad, go to hell, is actually a very, very old epic saying. In other words, you got to take a journey into the underworld. Odysseus made that journey. The great hero of the Aeneid, Aeneas, makes that journey. Of course, later it will be Dante in the Divine Comedy, and more particularly the Inferno, that makes that journey. In other words, he's playing with a very old question. When it comes time for me to take that journey, we said earlier, and uh, uh, we say it often in 303, that they taught you from the time you were very young that you had to go to the van when you were at the park. You don't get to swing forever at the park. You only get a small period of time to swing at the park. You ain't met no 200-year-old people. Think about the significance of that idea. That is to say, you don't get to stay alive forever. you got to go. So his first question is, when it's time for me to take that journey, line four, when this bright world blurs on my fading sight, what to me, he says, will be the keenest loss? So let's put it in our notes at level one. What's the first four lines ask? Can you put it in your own words? What does he ask in the first four lines? Simple, let's write it down. When I come to die, what do I miss the most? By the way, this is a really interesting 3B question. If you had to die tonight, what would be the thing about the years you've lived that you would miss most? What would that be? Can you write down what that would be? That's our first question. Notice part two of the poem. There's, this poem is divided into three parts. Part two of the poem. He says, I'll tell you what I won't. It, this won't be my keenest loss. Not that I don't love these things, but this is not what I'm going to miss the most. Read it with me. He says, Will it be that no more I shall see the trees, or smell the flowers, or hear the singing birds, or watch the flashing streams, or patient herds? By the way, see our end rhyme of birds and herds. Or smell the flowers, or hear the singing birds. Do you hear it? Or smell the flowers, or hear the singing birds. Notice he's eliciting all five of the senses, by the way, in this part. He says, you know what? I love nature, but that's not what I'm going to miss the most. The singing of the birds, the beautiful flowers and the trees, that's not what I'm going to miss the most. No, he says. Final, third part. No, he says. I am sure it will be none of these. But ah, uh, Manhattan's signs and sounds. Now, let's pause for a moment. What do we mean by Manhattan? Uh, two observations. One, we're talking about a borough of New York City. Two, if you'll remember from an earlier text, a 3A observation, remember the text by the waters of Babylon where the young boy takes his journey into the forbidden land of the gods? Remember where he ended up was in Manhattan, downtown New York City, Central Park, Broadway, the heart of of, many argue, the heart of America, the beating heart of America. Johnson is celebrating New York City. Notice your title is My City, right? That is to say it belongs to me. And it's interesting the way New Yorkers have always seen this. 3A observation, the inventor in many ways of this idea is the great American poet Walt Whitman. We'll study him in more detail in your junior year. But Whitman will often talk about Manhattan as his city. Johnson playing a very similar game. Manhattan, what is it he's going to miss about the city? Sights, sounds, her smells, her crowds, lots and lots of people, her throbbing force, throbbing here like a muscle or like blood pumping, right? Throbbing force. Hey, do you have a 3A, a film that immediately comes to mind of the city? It could be New York or it could be Chicago or any big city, where they show that shot from the, from the sky down and it shows all the lights and it shows all the cars and it looks kind of like blood vessels, blood going through veins and all the movement. And sometimes it's like sped up really fast to show you just how throbbing it is. That's this, that's this notion, right? The thrill, uh-oh, that comes from being of her apart. Notice he personifies Manhattan, the city, in female language. Her, right? If you will, his true love, his lover, is the city of New York, especially Manhattan. Um, notice, of uh, being her part, her subtle spells, he personifies the city as a woman. Her shining 
towers. Again, we immediately think about that tower of the young narrator in um, by the waters of Babylon in, in New York City. Now, of course, emptied of all its people because of the horrific apocalyptic end of the world war and all that. Her avenues, her slums with a dash. Now, put this in your notes at 3A. Carl Sandburg will play a very similar game in a, in a famous poem called Chicago, where he talks about his city, the city of the big shoulders and all of that, playing a very similar game. It isn't just the beautiful parts of the city. It is the slums. It's the bad parts of the city he celebrates as well. And then he finally says it, Oh God, in his final rhymed couplet, the stark unutterable un un pity. I can't, he says, I don't even want to speak about it. To be dead and never again behold my city, exclamation point. The worst imaginable thing for him is to die and not be able to be in this city anymore. Okay, so let's jump to 2A really quickly. What is for you the major theme or message here? Clearly the celebration of the city, one of those things. Some have seen this as a celebration of technology, the amazing thing called the city that humans have created. And while some students are, they're not attracted to large people, large numbers of people in the city like that, other students are... You know, the one thing I got to do is get out of this small town and I got to get to a place like the city because I'm done with the small town. So it's always, it's always about that. Let's jump to 2A though and say this as well. This is a poem that asks a really fascinating question. What will you miss most about this thing called living in this world? Will it be the world of nature? Or will it be the world of the created, technologically driven city? Right? Which, one, which will it be for you that you most will miss? That's his question. At 2B, well, we've mentioned already, notice our sonnet writing here, no doubt. The city is also a symbol of that which is the greatest prize. At 3A, we've already made the observations about the journey into the underworld, both of Odysseus as well as Aeneas in the Aeneid. We've mentioned Whitman and his classic celebrations of the city of New York, and especially Manhattan, as he calls it. What is for you your best text about the city? It may be a song. It may be a movie. It may be a video game. Notice how some video games, by the way, are set in the city. And some students love it that that's where it gets to be played. Other students like their video games set more out in the wilderness, in the mountains, or in the woods, or something like that. The obvious 3B question is two parts. One, what, what is your view of the city? Do you, do you like it when you go to the city? Do you, are you not so pleased? What's the largest city you've ever been in and what was that like for you? Did you like all the things he mentions as loving? The throbbing, the dynamism, the sound, the noise, the crowds, all the people. What was that like for you? And finally, at, 2B, at 3B, what will you miss the most? What will you miss the most about this thing called your life? If you had to leave it tonight, what would you most miss? Is it a place? Is it some person? What is it that you would most miss? Well, there you go, an introduction to Johnson's My City. I hope you've been challenged by it.